good evening uh, looks like a th thin population because of the jury times uh, thank you very much for coming on uh, part of the fa lecture series uh, i am pleased to welcome on behalf of sep university dr zain uh, from university of new south wales he is a professor of architecture he is presently uh, associate dean international and director of architecture he looks after the exchange activities and um, he has also headed in the past department of architecture university of technology sydney uh, zeen has a significant experience in architectural practice ranging from works working in china new zealand and presently in australia he is a scholar of international standing zeen has published on a cultural history of housing architecture anthropology vernacular architecture architectural education on louis kahn and modern architecture uh, and also looked at china's pre modern modern and contemporary art architecture as well uh, zee's essays has appeared in leading academic journals across the world his present uh, lecture today he is going to talk on why the meaning of architecture may not be intrinsically linked to its fabrication he is basically questions to uh, uh, will question to take the taken for granted modern doctrines that the meaning of architecture lies in its honest representation of the building's fabrication so we look forward for this very important view of architecture uh, uh, as as we debate architecture and its future direction thank you very much welcome jing Thank you for this uh, very generous introduction. A very important view, I think, is an overstatement. But I do want to deliberately uh, make a provocative sort of a point in order to uh, generate some conversation. This is an intimate kind of uh, environment, so I will try to make it more like a conversation. So hopefully, we will uh, have some discussions after I uh, finish what I have to say. Now, uh, I'm particularly delighted to be able to give a talk here, although I know uh, this is a difficult time because it's jury and uh, you all have to finish your work. And, uh, um, but uh, I'm pleased there are some people here. And uh, uh, I'm not just saying that as a matter of courtesy because there, there are two reasons why I'm particularly delight, delighted to give a talk at SEPT. One is that um, um, I... Um, spent some time yesterday to go and visit uh, Louis Kahn's IIM. And I always wanted to go and see that building. And because um, when I was the first year architecture student in Nanjing in the 1980s, and uh, my professor, uh, he was in his 80s, uh, a prominent Chinese architect, T.P. Yang, uh, when he was a student, he was in the same year with Louis Kahn at the University of Pennsylvania under the same French professor, Paul Philip Cray. And uh, Professor Young, when he was a young student, he did very well, a brilliant, brilliant student. And uh, according to him, you know, we often hear Louis Kahn's assertion uh, he talked about, you know, he was a very poor student and he spent so much of his uh, time to unlearn what he learned. But in fact, he was a good student and Paul Cray liked him. So, but according to Professor Young, he was not as good as himself as a student. So they went on to become on the surface very different architects. One practiced in China, one uh, uh, built some most remarkable buildings uh, in the U.S. and also in this country and, and in Dhaka. And, but I have written about their work and beyond the surface, whether or not they share something. So for me, I think I will end today's uh, talk uh, with what I saw yesterday. And, um, and that is related to this topic. Yeah. On a different note, and uh, I'm also particularly delighted to be able to give a talk in Professor Doshi's building. And uh, I met him some 20 years ago in Chandigarh for an interesting reason, because he 
uh, picked a, New Ze a young New Zealand architect at the international competition and uh, who went on to become, again, one of the most prominent architects in New Zealand. And uh, so when I saw Doshi 20 years ago, I was actually working with this New Zealand architect. So there's an interesting link. Uh, and I will talk about this architect's work uh, uh, towards the end of today's lecture. So it's because of this background. I know it's a, a little long-winded, but it's special for me, that this particular occasion. Now, you have seen the title, and uh, um, I'm going to start with, uh, oh, what I'm doing. I'm going to start with a little test. I'm going to ask you, I, I trust, uh, all of you are architecture students or architects. And uh, to take a look at of this architecture detail and uh, see if you recognize it. Yeah. This could have been anything. This could be a uh, ordinary, you know, glassy commercial building in Amandabad or could be the door of my hotel, you know, which I'm staying. What about this one? Ah, you see, someone finally recognized it. <laughs> Correct. Uh, this is a very famous building. Uh, it was demolished, but uh, uh, now um, it was reconstructed, but very much based on the same design. And. Uh, I show these two images, and this one, and, uh, and then the next one, um, to raise a particular issue in architecture. Again, against the, the backgr background where I come from. Now, this would not be regarded, at least in Australia, as a uh, very well crafted or very well made or beautifully and thoroughly designed sort of a detailing for a building. Yeah. And uh, these days, um, it would be almost inconceivable uh, for someone to win an architecture award in a country like Australia that I'm familiar with, with that level of the crudeness, if you like, in terms of the detailing. Yeah. Um, what do you think against the background of this country? I'm sure you would not regard it as, as something that is particularly intriguing, intricate, very well crafted, beautifully made. But in Australia, uh, the extreme that, that level of the obsession in terms of how buildings are assembled and fabricated and put together has reached a degree. And uh, that is, you know, architects sometimes uh, uh, even take pride in promoting a kind of level of craftsmanship. And that is excessive and obsessive. And they even claim that, oh, well, a door handle or a water tap and something, it's all custom made, beautifully crafted, and done to a degree that almost like a piece of jewelry. And a, a building is treated like a piece of jewelry. So if we leave aside that bit of crude detailing and, and construction, and my question is whether or not the way in which this building is assembled and put together, and uh, that crudeness has in any way diminished the true meaning of this building. Yeah. And uh, this building, of course, is uh, the quintessential exemplary of what Mies promoted. It is a kind of architecture that Mies almost wanted to do away without architecture if I may put it in this way. Yeah. Because that was everything that is against 
the conventional notion of having to build something. What is a house? What is a building? That is to have a roof above you, to have four walls around you, and therefore, your very weakness is protected, and that's the true meaning. And Mies did something to challenge that, to a degree, you know, that is no demarcation between inside and outside, and、uh, the building must.、Uh, Diminish and become almost invisible, and that sense of confidence and freedom of the space is celebrated to the extreme. And of course, his enthu- enthusiastic followers have turned that into something more or less like an ascetic obsession. Hence, we have minimalism. We have the celebration of something that is. Remarkably sleek and smooth, and、uh, and, and then、uh, the level of the obsession in terms of its fabrication. But how much of that is related to the true meaning of the kind of building that he wanted to he wanted to create at the conceptual level? But even if you look at that level. Of、um, poverty, if you like, in terms of、uh, in terms of the way something that is almost a shelter, but not quite a shelter, when it is created, and that level of the、uh, sleekness and uh, and uh, and uh, 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 something that is reduced to to bare minimum. And you question well. I think Joseph Rickwood made uh, a quite uh,、um, uh, a daring remark when Miss was at the peak of his career. When Miss was probably one of the most copied architects on the planet, and and Joseph Rickwood、uh, said, "This is sickening. This is the kind of building without any flesh." But. That comment is really the comment on what the building looks like, not so much what it actually means,、uh, what this building is trying to say. But despite its look, whether or not modern architecture or the kind of building promoted by Mies in terms of its、uh, fabrication、uh, has already completely departed from. A pre-modern building. If you look at the pre-modern building, let's say even a 19th-century building, and uh, uh, you see a clear、uh, differentiation between the interior envelope and the exterior envelope. I think the exterior envelope has been washed away a bit, but you can still see it, and the interior is depicted with. A remarkable level of the detail, and the emphasis of that rendering, that rendu, is on the atmosphere that is created by the degree of the enclosure and its openness. And then there's the exterior envelope, and that is the uh, uh, definition of the building as an object. Both of which make you aware of your existence. Once you are inside of the building, you are in the center of this man-made universe. If you are outside of the building, that building against the blue sky, if you have blue sky,、uh, makes you aware of the existence of the object. So, when architecture was first taught in the French Ecole de Beaux-Arts, oh, the, sorry,、um, the Academy, before it became、uh, uh, Ecole de Beaux-Arts,、uh, in the late 19th century. And、uh, they actually did not know what should be taught in architecture until, you know, a few two、uh, hundred years later, towards the end of the nineteenth century, in the earlier twentieth century, when two things emerged in a very crystal clear manner, where they used these two uh, uh, terms to describe. One is uh, uh, push. Uh, that's that's pocket. To describe, you know,、uh, the kind of 
cavities uh, which are uh, blackened to in indicate the solid parts of the building and where the opening and doors and windows are, are left open. So the flesh and the, the, the solidity of the building is a very important part of the art of designing and push. Of course, there's the idea of party, and, uh, uh, which I will return to, to uh, ask what exactly does a building say, despite or regardless of the form of its construction system. So these two things go hand in hand. And uh, uh, the reason I show them is to, to ask whether or not the kind of architecture that mispromoted uh, uh, is an indication that we are already um, uh, um, uh, beyond that particular way of conceiving a building. But there's nothing new. Before architecture was taught in the academy, uh, and uh, uh, humanity already had uh, you know, thousands of years built history um, um, behind, behind us. And uh, if you look at this uh, interior of one of the Palladio villas, those splendid villas that you often associate with them with uh, the kind of monumental quality and uh, the beautiful proportion, the ideal proportion. And uh, that, that's how we, at a conventional, conventional level, read Palladio. And uh, I was very delighted to, to see this. Uh, Palladio still appears on your blackboard. <laughs> um, but the, behind that solid um, uh, uh, surface, uh, masonry solid surface of uh, Renaissance architecture, lines in uh, a different kind of construction system where the timber frame, which is absolutely necessary for the floors and for the roof trust, uh, is, is very much part of its uh, construction system. But how much of that uh, is intrinsically linked to the very meaning of the Palladio Villa? Again, I will return to that. But I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you timber construction which is very much part of the architecture, part of the architecture itself in a different tradition. So the Chinese timber frame. By the earlier 12th century, the Chinese had already um, worked out a complete building menu in Zhao Fa Shi, which was used as a legislation. And the purpose of that legislation is anti-corruption, so that you know, the use of the material, the cost of labor, and, uh, and, and et cetera, would be uh, controlled, legislated, and unified throughout the country. But in order to do, to do that, the entire timber framework would be systematically recorded and unified. And at that level of the intricacy of the timber framework, and uh, I think a, a um, uh, timber frame behind a palladio uh, facade would be in no comparison. Yeah. Now, so if we use a set of our modern mentality, if we believe you know, uh, the way in which an object is assembled together, put together, is in fact intrinsically and, uh, and uh, 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 connected to what it does to you in terms of your way of living in it. And uh, uh, we would be wrong. Because in the case of Claudio, just to use one exa example, and uh, uh, the true meaning of its villas lies in somewhere else, not so much about its monumental elevation and, uh, 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 and also its interior system, um, timber framework, and masonry as that combination, somewhere else. 
but even for Barcelona Pavilion, and uh, uh, if you zoom in very slowly, you will you will realize a piece of very thin roof, as sleek as that of Barcelona Pavilion, is still a form of uh, what the French call Porsche. It's still part of po pocket, and you still have to do the framework. You still have to clad it. And uh, uh, you do as much as you can to make it thinner. Yeah. And for the sake of that imagery representation of something that at, at a conceptual level Mies uh, wanted to achieve. But he was probably not so fast about um, how things are put together. Yeah. So the kind of crudeness is actually everywhere. Uh, but does that really matter? And when I uh, showed these images, and when I surprised some of our uh, colleagues in Australia who are very much into making a building to to the level where you know uh, a piece of jewelry is 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 made, and they were a little uncomfortable and probably feeling a little bit unease about about that. And uh, they are very itching. They would like to redesign it, redetail it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to very quickly. I I, I realize I'm I'm quickly running out of time. I, I was going to to do a 40-minute talk, <laughs> but I think the introduction is a little bit long-winded. But I can I can speed up from this point just to show you uh, throughout the long history some selected examples. The examples are. Uh, 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 many, and uh, I, I think I would like to use the development in English housing as a, as a, um, a series of examples to show um, what a building does and through what, and also the development of the uh, construction system and the fabrication. Yeah. So we all know uh, when uh, the Anglo-Saxons. Um, Drove out the Romans, and um, uh, in earlier fifth century, and uh, they were absolutely overwhelmed by this splendid civilization, you know, left by the Romans, uh, villas and cities and bathhouses, and uh, and also very sophisticated um, uh, building systems. They they left them aside. They they let them become ruins. For 300 years, London was a ghost city, yeah. and uh, slowly they developed a kind of thing that is uh, uh, quintessentially their own. And one of the key features of of, of their architecture is uh, is called hall in English housing. But in earlier days, and we know, and uh, that particular building is. Uh, made of uh, cross lock structure and thatched roof, <coughs> but it is the heart of the estate, and the, the lord would be the center of this gregarious kind of living, where people from different walks of life and different cl classes uh, would mix, and the strangers and the, and the locals, and a trestle table would be set up for eating, and a bed could be set up when needed. Only you know the Lord and the lady would have something can be called a room or a chamber somewhere. And uh, later on, when masonry structure was used, but the very meaning of the English hall uh, remains unchanged. And gradually, uh, the segregation of activities. Uh, started to happen, and then they would go in the horizontal way and also vertical way. So that would be a room for the Lord, that would be a solar, a chamber, and maybe a chapel, and maybe a, a tower and the storage. They would enclose them, but very much for defense. So if you look at uh, uh, this building that, that still stands, Penhurst in Kent, uh, still intact, the, the whole. You would see the earlier enclosure for defensive purpose. Sorry. 
And then you look at what is uh, remaining, what is what still remains t today, and the whole itself. Uh, so it it by by that time, and uh, it was already a different kind of construction system. Yeah, masonry building and uh, um, timber trust to make the roof, and the rather handsome and and beautiful holes. Uh, were already constructed, yeah. But the life lived in it, in essence, had not changed. Yeah, the configuration, the spatial configuration, the French would later call it party, uh, would remain exactly the same. So if you look at this depiction of a rather rowdy thing by uh, this uh, very skillful 19th century uh, English illustrator, Joseph Nash. And you can see exactly the same kind of life that was lived in a beautifully built uh, uh, building. Exactly the same kind of construction system. And uh, um, centuries later, by the 16th century, uh, something changed. Something ch changed fundamentally and dramatically, not because of the building construction system, but because of the building configuration. So, as you can see, this very detailed and accurate depiction, again, from Joseph Nash of Wallerton Hall, and uh, that's a 16th century, on the surface, a, a sort of an English Italian uh, country house. But in essence, it's a very English thing. But when you look at how the building, the, the hall was used, you, you see it, it was used as a dining hall. And the dining hall has nothing to do with what we have seen in medieval times. And that kind of uh, uh, a mix of social classes and that kind of uh, you know, gregarious uh, collective living was completely gone. And people would sit there, um, you know, uh, that elegant hall uh, with the dining table, and they would eat in a very different way. So the entire eating etiquette was based on a strict level of segregation. So segregation was the key. You would command your own set of uh, uh, um, plates and bowls and the culinary uh, uh, things. And uh, you would only talk to someone next to you. So it's a different eating etiquette. But that's an indication of a different kind of life, which I will show you later. This is what the building looks like. Because slowly, the English developed more rooms. The rooms would be dedicated to different purposes, and uh, they would become more and more specific, starting from the hall, very much devoted to dining, to um, pantry and kitchen, and in a typical sort of uh, Elizabethan uh, uh, large country house, and you would have chapel, you would have the bed chamber, you would have the library, you would have uh, um, a king's apartment, um, an important purpose to build these sort of buildings uh, is to hopefully attract the king or queen to come to, to, come to, to visit and stay there. Yeah. It is about the segregation. Uh, this is what the building looks like today. It's used by the, by the city council to hold activities for, uh, for its citizens. It's no longer a, a dining hall, yeah. and still a beautiful building. But the development in the history of English housing is a slow um, uh, development of further and higher degree of segregation to a degree, when we reach 19th century, which we will, we will, we will see it, and where the segregation reached uh, a, a, a paramount level, which was uh, basically a hallmark of English life, and later on, 
and that has become a hallmark of uh, modernity. Yeah. On the one hand, that's the development of self-consciousness. On the one, on the other hand, at the practical, pra practical level, we call it the development of privacy. Let's return to Pladio. Let's look at the one on your uh, blackboard, and let's look at uh, a dozen of them that I have included here, which was uh, uh, brilliantly summarized by Whitaker. Whitaker did not call them party diagrams, but I can easily use this French term to call them party diagrams. This is the kind of drawing of architecture. Uh, without any consideration of its Porsche, Porsche. The, the thickness of the wall and the, the degree of the openness, its proportion and the, its size, etc., etc. It is the very essence of what a building conf configuration would do to you in terms of uh, 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 the, the kind of way of life that is accommodated. And in the case of uh, Andrew Pladio, any of his villa. To the English mind, uh, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century English mind, this would be a faulty plan because all the rooms are interconnected. All the rooms are connected through a visual vista from the uh, uh, subordinary ones to the major ones. And eventually, that would lead you to this uh, uh, great frame, almost like a camera viewfinder of the cultivated landscape. So the building works like a visual device. And the, 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 the building, all these country villas, unlike the English houses, and they were only lived in the summer uh, for the Veneto, Venetian nobles to spend the long leisurely summer to study uh, literature and philosophy, to have uh, leisurely conversations, and to, to have a party against this splendid backdrop. But in a symbolic way, powerful symbolic way, the building is to project, to project that capacious world. Yeah. And that's Renaissance, that's not medieval. Yeah. And that's not English. The English you know, would, would regard this as a puzzle. I mean, even you know, for the 18th century uh, uh, visit, uh, Goethe, when he went there, he admired the beauty of its proportion and its monumentality. But, uh, but he remarked, he said, yes, it's beautiful, but not very homely. <laughs> but a major function of Villa Rotunda was uh, uh, was a was a setting like a theater box uh, for the nobles to uh, to party and uh, to watch the to watch the fireworks in the valley. Okay, let me uh, again. I will need to speed up. Use one more English example, and uh, to uh, illustrate precisely that the line of the argument I've been trying to I've been trying to uh, present to you. That is the uh, quintessential example of the English arts and crafts movement. So when William Morris and, and his uh, architect colleague Philip Well worked together to design this famous red house, and uh, their idea, their idea was uh, to uh, create a kind of medieval revival, if you liked because they were medievalists, very much influenced by uh, John Ruskin's writings. And also, they uh, formed a group of, uh, uh, you know, Bohemian, um, a, a group of uh, um, uh, Bohemian artists, the, the, the very famous pre raphaelite group. So they were idealistic, they wanted to recreate that level of the uh, craftsmanship and, uh, and, uh, and the honorable labor that is associated with how things were made. And they did it in a, in a, in a very uh, convincing way, uh, from interior to exterior. And they spent a lot of time together 
Morris and his uh, artist friends, um, Bernie Jones and, and, and his family, uh, decorated it, decorated the building, painted the building, and did the fabric. And also that was the starting point of his uh, career as a designer. But how does that building do to people? Now, when the English architecture historian looked at this plan, Robin Evans, and he said, this is a 19th century English plan. Yeah. Uh, whether or not it's a large townhouse in a city sandwiched by other buildings, or a country house that you could spread your wings, or in this instance, yeah, a medieval revival kind of building. But it is a building that is uh, fundamentally supported by the use of a corridor and terminal rooms. So every room, once you close your door, and it's completely uh, segregated from the other rooms. So uh, the two rooms next door to each other, and also the rooms at the two, end, two bookends would have exactly the same relationship because of the use of the corridor. And in the case of Pladio, and that's a completely different concept, a completely different party. I, I think Robin Evans was a little bit too simplistic and, and, and a little bit too um, um, rash, because when you examine the corridor and also the relationship between corridor and the garden, and also the relationship uh, between the corridor uh, as enlarged to encourage uh, more sort of interaction. They did try to some degree to create a more kind of uh, um, uh, 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 gregarious communal sort of living between the masters and servants and also among um, the uh, 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 those people who cohabited the building, the, the, the different families together. But there are interesting contradictions. Their life lived in that building was full of contradiction. You know, when uh, uh, William Morris attempted to paint uh, his future wife, Jane, and she was uh, uh, spotted by uh, Rossetti, um, you know, uh, they were attracted by what they uh, re regarded as a kind of pale beauty and they used her as, as a model. But uh, uh, his clumsy attempt, attempt to paint her, you know, he realized that he had no talent um, to become a painter. And uh, so he, uh, he said, I can never paint you, but I love you better. Uh, unfortunately, I think Jen had a um, a long um, affair with uh, Rossetti, and uh, even um, after they left the Red House. But they tried very hard to live that sort of life, as you can see these sort of uh, uh, drawings, uh, uh, characters by his, uh, by his artistic friends. You know, he was larger than life, and uh, he was very uh, inclined to the socialist thinking, and uh, he was generous host. Uh, that sort of life, in the end, did not last for too long. And uh, he had to sell the house at a lower price, um, and uh, less than the construction cost, and purchase of the property, and then return to the city in order to run his, uh, his business, uh, design business. But in the end, and uh, uh, he decided, you know, together with Rossetti, to, to rent this true medieval house, a very simple, non-pretentious one. And uh, even the life lived in the house was somehow very basic. Yeah. And uh, the, the level of the com comfort was, uh, was very basic. And he was, on the one hand, truly happy, but on the other hand, the configuration of that house uh, was a very loose one. Yeah. It's, it's still a, a medieval uh, um, a house. And then he tolerated this uh, ongoing 
fair between Rossetti and 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 Jane. That's uh, the famous Kelmscott. Uh, uh, so when Robin Evans looked at uh, uh, this contradiction, on the one hand, it's the deliverance of the building, the way in which the Red House was built. Yeah, uh, the, 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 it's, uh, it's, uh, its look, its material, and, the, and the, the labor that was used to build it and the pursuit of uh, Morris and his uh, like-minded people. On the other hand, it's plan. And uh, he remarked that the medievalists and the modernists actually share the same con conviction. That is the belief that the meaning of things actually lie in its fabrication. But in reality, a building works in a different way. Now, I'm going to end with a very different building. And this building is in New Zealand. It is a building uh, the New Zealand architect Ying Airfield started uh, in 1965, the year I was born. And by the time he died two years ago, uh, the building uh, is still not finished, was not finished. In Ethfield, as a young man, entered the international competition, which is a Philippines uh, housing competition to revitalize a slam area in the 1970s. Professor Doshi was the jury, and he selected the Ethfield scheme as the winning scheme. But at the ending, of that uh, competition was a sad one because there was a corruption and uh, the local people uh, had a problem with the uh, uh, kind of approach that, um, that comes from, comes from uh, the top. And uh, politically charged and also corruption because the money for that project was used by Mrs. Marcos to buy her shoes. So that did not go ahead. But it was an auspicious launch of uh, uh, this architect's career, and he went on to become one of the most remarkable architects in New Zealand. But I'm going to show you this building. He started in 1965, and then it grew almost like a village, and uh, on this hillside of uh, Wellington's Kandala, overlooking this beautiful harbor. The building, of course, was built in many stages with different construction systems, some timber and some masonry. And uh, he even experimented uh, polystyric kind of uh, structure with uh, 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 cement and uh, reinforced concrete um, uh, put it inside um, to get the structure strength. And he continued to build in different ways, you know, which way, whichever was affordable or uh, low-skilled builders would do it. Uh, and in the end, and uh, uh, wherever possible, he would plaster them inside and out. So when I asked him, why do you do that? You know, and why, 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 why do you always try to plaster your building and to hide uh, its construction system? And uh, his answer was uh, half serious and half humorous one. And he said, ah, I just wanted to cover the scenes of construction. Yeah. But the building itself works as a remarkable place. And it is a true representation of his architecture ideal. And uh, he believes people should live in villages. That is uh, small enough to form a kind of uh, relationship, intimate relationship, people would know each other. But it is also big enough in order for you to have some of your own uh, uh, space, very much like Kang's idea. So it is more in interconnected than segregated. It looks nothing like a Palladio villa. It looks nothing like an Italian Renaissance building. But it works in the way. 
in a very similar kind of way. And he lived his, uh, 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 his ideal. So um, in the early 90s, and uh, both my wife and I uh, worked with him and associated with him. At that time, in this village, and uh, uh, there's an office of 20 old architects, and uh, uh, his elderly parents there, his children were also there. One of his uh, sons was studying architecture. I was his tutor. And uh, they are friends, they are artists, uh, they are renters. <coughs> there's a peacock, a cop of dogs, there's a goat, and the parrots. And parrots have been trained to mock the sort of uh, uh, annoying clients. And uh, it was that kind of life, the heydays of this building. Yeah. All of which is very much the outcome of its party, its village idea. That's where the concept lies. Not so much the way in which it is built and fabricated. Now, yesterday, I was uh, uh, lucky enough to get access to see uh, Khan's um, uh, IIM, which I um, always wanted to see, because um, I have seen many of his buildings, particularly those ones in the United States. I show you this image. I show you this image to, um, to say that this building was built based on what was available. Yeah, and I think I understand that that sort of material palette and construction system are still being used. This campus is a, is a living example. Uh, it, is not, it is not the most sheep shape level of the craftsmanship. Yeah, and uh, there are problems, problems of reinforced concrete, as you can see. Yeah, serious problems, because once that started, there's no cure. Yeah. Uh, completely different from similar kind of buildings that he uh, uh, built in the United States. I'll give you one example, that is the Exeter Library. Beautifully built, absolutely sheep shape, and uh, to the level of the kind of detail that is no more, no less. The question is whether or not that not so perfect construction system and the problems that we see today have in any way diminished the power of this building and the meaning of this building. Not in the slightest sense. I was absolutely overwhelmed by the experience when I walked through the building yesterday. And there were school children visiting that building. There are activities in his plaza, and people were having sort of fun uh, contests. And, uh, but there are smaller groups, and the students, uh, they could find a corner here, and uh, a nook there, and sit down and talk to each other. Very much like his universal party, a building would accommodate both learning, that's a private activity, and meeting, that's a social activity. He used the party for everything, from a parliament house to a Jewish synagogue to a library and to this magnificent uh, campus building. Yeah. And I think I would, I would end um, this talk by making two remarks. One is the ethics of uh, craftsmanship. The other one is erotics of it. The ethics of the craftsmanship and the uh, is a historical topic. You know, starting from Vitruvius, he would uh, advise architects uh, the level of the uh, craftsmanship and what should be given at what level. He would not regard those ones who uh, do not hold the public space to build splendid and, uh, and the regal uh, uh, atriums. And that should only be done by those ones who hold public surface and pub public office, and therefore uh, the poor and the ordinary people would come to enjoy as a civic space. 
so the atrium is open to the street. In the Chinese history, you know, uh, the level of the craftsmanship was always restricted, never encouraged to be excessive, otherwise it's unethical. And uh, so this is nothing new. And I think uh, at the time we were so obsessed with the technique and the skill of, of craftsmanship, we should question whether or not it's also an ethical problem. Because my sense is that we have been so drawn to the erotics of it. And I have uh, 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 paraphrased this from a famous essay by uh, Susan Sontag. And uh, the essay is entitled Against Interpretation. That was reason for her to say that. But of course, I think when the erotics of art and the erotics of craftsmanship, and that, that has been the level of the, the, the visceral experience has been elevated to the level uh, uh, of excess. And I think this is where uh, we are having some, some issues. And that level of the ob obsession uh, may have very little to do with the true power of architecture. I think I've used too much time, uh, but now I end here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to take any questions if uh, there's any interest. Well, I, I think your remarks are precisely what I have been trying to say. That is, uh, uh, it is not a critique of the uh, crudeness of the detailing. And uh, the point is that uh, uh, despite that, and the power of the architecture, the meaning lies elsewhere. That's precisely what you have said. Yeah. But I started the lecture by uh, borrowing the, the kind of um, critique that you may receive from some of our fellow architects these days and, uh, and the, the level of the care or the level of the obsession that, that they, would, uh, they, would, uh, they would invest in, in, their, in their design. So this is, how, this is where the question started. Yeah. But that's precisely the point I've been trying to make. Yeah, well, Australia has rough climate, and uh, but uh, um, pretty much uh, 
in the middle of the country and where there's very little sort of built work. And uh, most of the coastal cities where um, the majority of the population live and uh, uh, the climates are uh, mild. In, in fact, uh, it's a, a quite ideal kind of climate. So uh, I think the getaway, the getaway, um, they, 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 they are not, Australian architects are not, not faced with very difficult um, weathering conditions. But I think that's also uh, a, a, um, a issue in, in their mentality. That is, uh, there's this uh, uh, false hope that a building must uh, be uh, absolutely sheep shape, perfectly, perfectly uh, uh, constructed, and it will remain so forever. And I think that is not only technically wrong, but uh, ethically, that's also a problem. Now, I say that particularly in the context of this country and this city. Now, what, what I have seen in the last day or so is that uh, when you have the resources to build certain buildings, such as this one, yeah, and uh, whether it's in the uh, earlier part of the 20th century or even now you use the same construction system, and uh, if the ongoing maintenance or uh, the need of very little maintenance is not a part of your consideration, and then I think you know, that becomes an ethical issue. So w w what, what I would like to argue is that uh, ethics and the aesthetics are never se uh, separated and should never be separated. This, once, we are, once we are drawn to aesthetics as something of beauty and all that, and, and I think we are already in the dangerous territory because we forget the original meaning of aesthetics. The original meaning of aesthetics is the opposite of uh, anesthetics. One is a deadening experience, the other one is you become alive if you're full of vitality and uh, you, you, you have aesthetics. It has, nothing, it has nothing to do with just beauty and all that. And I, I think the, the danger zone that we are in is we are so much drawn to what, it, what things look like, which is fine. I mean, Susan Sontag would remark, you know, and uh, uh, what, what you see is a very important part of our senses. True, particularly in Western culture, you know, vision and hearing are absolutely dominant. But don't forget, in other cultures, that may not be the same, may not be the case. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the touching could be quite important. Uh, uh, smell could be quite important. So the, the, that, that part of the synthesis should not be forgotten. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thanks for coming.